Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons, interestingly enough, is on the Gospel of Mark. Hmm. You might have thought that everything could, that could possibly be said about the Gospel of Mark has already been said. But this, one's, this lesson is entitled, Miracles Around the Lake. And you probably have already guessed what lake that is. This is lesson number five in our series for August 3 of 2024. We'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we once again take up your word and see just a few ideas that are scattered around the Lake of Galilee, to see what Jesus did there, I can imagine that the young people would wake up in the morning and say, Mom, can I go see Jesus? I mean, there's no part of that lake that's farther, so far away you can't sort of walk there in the morning and then come back in the afternoon. And yet, so many of those people rejected him. It's hard to imagine how that could happen. But let's see if we can learn more by reviewing some of these miracles in this lesson as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This lesson discusses mainly miracles performed around the Sea of, Ga of Galilee. Jim? Well, the Bible study guide, Jesus' ministry was largely focused in Galilee, especially in and around the Sea of Galilee, a lake approximately 13 miles, that is 21 kilometers long, and eight miles, that is 13 kilometers wide. It is the largest body of water in the area and was a center of life for people living nearby. Mark 4 ends with Jesus and his gospel, excuse me, Jesus and his disciples traveling across the Sea of Galilee. A storm arises that Jesus calms by speaking to the winds and waves. Mark 6 ends with a similar scene, but this time with Jesus walking on the water toward his disciples in the boat. In between these scenes on the water are numerous miracles of Jesus that were done on the land and in his disciples' first ministry missionary activity. These stories are the subject of this study. I, let me interrupt for a second. I wish these stories were the subject of this study. How much do we know about... Jesus sent them off, his disciples, to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers. How much do we know? Where, where, are, the, where are the stories of that? I mean, did, did Judas raise the dead? Have you ever asked yourself that question? He was one of the disciples. Um, I wish we, I really, really, that's one of the things I'm really looking forward to seeing when we get the panorama. It's a, like in Genesis, uh, and he says, he speaks to the, the storms and everything, mm -hmm. calms it down, and here on the Sea of Galilee, mm -hmm. he talks to it. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and everybody's <laughs> calmed down and the storms are okay. calmed down. It's amazing. Okay, uh, go ahead. The overarching characteristic of these dramatic stories is to let the reader see who Jesus is. He is the one able to calm the storm, cast out demons, heal a woman with, who simply t touches his clothes, raise a dead girl, preach in his own, t in his home, excuse me, preach his hometown. Preach in his hometown. Send out his disciples on a preaching mission, feed with a few loaves and fish, and walk on water. Incredible displays of power that are drawing the disciples closer to an understanding that he is the Son of God. Okay, now the question, which we, we need to keep asking, how long did it take for the disciples to sort of figure out, okay, this isn't, in, this isn't any ordinary Joe. Did they... Well, if you're raising de dead or healing s <laughs> uh, blind people and so forth. <laughs> well, yeah. When, which disciple was it, Andrew? Yeah. Went to, to call his brother or his... Yeah, we found the Messiah. Said, we found the Messiah. Well, but they had a different picture Yeah, of exactly. The a very different idea about the Messiah. That's right. And they really didn't finally understand it until after his resurrection. That's that right. Correct. So I mean, exactly. with all, yeah, I mean, in close the, proximity. The, 
He still didn't. The only one who saw Christ in his real divine beauty before the cross, I'll argue, was a woman and she was a prostitute. Yeah. I'm not in a position to argue against uh, that. Well, in this lesson, we will cover some amazing stories, including several miracles described in Mark 4, 35 to 652. It begins with the weary Jesus sleeping in the back of the boat and then calming the storm with his hand. I, I just love that story. I mean, here's all these fishermen. They have grown up and lived on that lake, and they're about to be drowned by this in this boat. And what do they do? They ask the carpenter to help them. <laughs> of course, by that time... He's sleeping. He's sleeping. Yeah, I mean, he, That's why... He, he, don't you know what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he sent their demons... Uh, uh, um, they say, he cast demons out of two men in a, Galilee, in a Gentile territory on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He sent their demons into herd of pigs, which then drowned in the Sea of Galilee. Next, he sent the formerly demon-possessed men to be the first Gentile missionaries mm -hmm. to the Decapolis. He returned to Capernaum, where he healed two of God's daughters who were either dead or effectively dead. Then Jesus returned to Nazareth, where he was rejected because he claimed to be the Messiah and favored Gentiles over Jews from two Old Testament stories. About that same time, Jesus received the report about the death of John the Baptist. Just at that point, he sent his disciples out throughout Galilee to preach John's message. He said, John's dead. You can preach the message for him. Um, sorry. Then Jesus, trying to escape the crowds by returning, trying to escape the crowds by returning to an area near Bethsaida in the north, discovered huge crowds were waiting for him. And they don't explain that at all here in, in this lesson, but Ellen White explains it very clearly. You can see all the way across the, the, the Sea of Galilee, no problem. So when Jesus and his disciples took off, the people said, there he goes, watch it, where's he headed? They were running along the shore so they, could, they got to where he was going before he did. So that's what happened. Um, discovered huge crowds waiting for him. He preached to them and taught them for the whole day with no one providing any food. He fed the 5,000 men, not counting women and children, and then sent his disciples away in the boat across the sea back to Capernaum. And the he, question, go ahead. He attracted kids. I mean, can mm -hmm. you, you can picture a 14 year old kid says, mommy, I want to go and listen to this gentleman. Mm -hmm. I will take some food with you. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. How and he's, he's so busy listening to Jesus, he right. doesn't eat his lunch. Right, right. <laughs> wow. You know, I have grandsons, and they're a little bit past that age. They're in their 20s now, but even so, I have granddaughters that are approaching that age. Right, right. Well, trying to escape the crowds by returning to an area near Bethsaida, discovered the huge crowds there. He's preached to them, taught them all the whole day with no one providing any food. He fed the 5,000 men, not counting women and children, and then sent his disciples away in the boat across the sea back to Capernaum. This series of miracles see, started a swell of emotion to try to force Jesus to become the king of the Jews. I mean, anybody with their perverted idea, their mistaken idea about who the king of the Jews who the Messiah was going to, what the Messiah was going to do. Okay, if you, if you believe the things that they believe about what the Messiah was going to do, I mean, here, if there was anybody who ever could do all those things, it has to be Jesus. This I learned uh, several yeah. years ago through um, Focus on the Family. Mm -hmm. And um, Lake Genesaret was fairly, fairly shallow. So the wind would really strike out huge uh, waves. And here were the fishermen, Mm -hmm. who should have known knew the place very, very well. And uh, people around the lake worshipped wind and the waves, mm -hmm. you see. And so here is a man stands up, peace be still. Mm -hmm. was, wow, he has power over the wind and the waves. Yep. He's bigger than the gods that we serve. Mm -hmm. Well, Following, so Jesus then sends his disciples in, the, puts his disciples in the boat and sends them off. He dispatches the crowds. And what does he do? He goes up the hill to pray. And then walking on the water back to join his disciples in their boat. Wow. Jesus demonstrated that with his miracle working power, he could easily have helped the Jews conquer and drive out the Romans. But 
that was not the kind of kingdom he was trying to establish. Mark 4, 35 to 41. On the evening of that same day, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they left the crowd. The disciples got into the boat in which Jesus was already sitting, and they took him with them. Other boats were there too. Suddenly a strong, strong wind blew up and the waves began to spill over the boat, to the boat so that it was about to fill with water. Jesus was in the back of the boat sleeping with his head on a pillow. The disciples woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care that we are about to drown, die? Jesus stood up and commanded the wind, Be quiet! As he said to the waves, Be still. The wind died down and there was a great calm. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Why are you so frightened? Have you done still no faith? But they were terribly afraid that, and said to one another, Who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him? You know, if you really believe that it was God himself sleeping in the back of the boat. You know, when he says, uh, back that up there a second mm -hmm. here, when uh, Charles says, he shouts out, be quiet. I think he just says, be quiet. I don't think he had to say it loudly. No, no, that's although the although there were other people in other boats around that were about dying too, so he might have said it loud enough so they could hear. But the mes yeah. message is, yeah. be quiet. Mm -hmm. and he, that, so he's trying to show that he has power that there's no finite being he can yeah. display. So I put this idea in, and I'm, I'm, I really think we need to give this serious consideration. Do you think this was just chance, bad circumstances at the Sea of Galilee? Or was it a deliberate attempt by the devil to destroy Jesus and all of the disciples at once? Yes. I'm fairly sure it was the latter. They were scared. They, these were yeah. these were hardened fishermen. fishermen. They were yeah. seasoned fishermen, and they were scared to death. Mm -hmm. They were going to die. So yes. Later, Jesus suggested that they cross the Sea of Galilee, going to the area of Gadarenes. So we pick up another story from the Bible study guide. This story in Mark four thirty-five to forty-one fits within a common biblical pattern, that of a theophany. What does theophany mean? The appearance of God or one of his angels. Okay. For the Bible study guide. Five characteristics are common to these events. One, the display of divine power. Two, human fear. Three, the command, do not fear. Four, the words of revelation for which God or the angel appeared. And five, human response to the revelation. Four of the five are present in this story. The calming of the storm is a display of divine power. The disciple's fear is the human fear. The question, why are you so afraid, is the do not be afraid or do not fear. The disciple's question, who then is this, is the human response. Mm. What is missing is the words of revelation. Aren't they all revelation? Okay. This missing detail plays into the revolution Revelation. revelation slash secrecy motif that runs through the entire book where the truth about Jesus will come out. Here the disciples question, who then is this that the wind and the sea obey him? Pushes the reader to fill in the answer of the missing words of Revelation. Uh -huh. He is the Son of God, the Lord himself, from the Bible study guide for Sunday. Okay, do you think that the disciples or one of the other followers of Jesus must have asked Jesus at for if after at least one of these miracles, how did you do that? Mm -hmm. I mean, one well, some of the kids at least must have asked that. How did you do that? Did you do that? Or well, I, yeah. I don't think there was any question that he did it. Yeah. Okay, Myra. From Mark 5, verses 1 to 20. Jesus and his disciples arrived at the other side of the Lake Galilee in the territory of Gereza. 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 As soon as Jesus got out of the boat, he was met by a man who came out 
of the burial caves there. This man had an evil spirit in him and lived among the tombs. Nobody could keep him chained up anymore. Many times his feet and hands had been chained, but every time he broke the chains and smashed the irons on his feet, he was too strong for anyone to control him. Day and night he wandered among the tombs and through the hills, screaming and cutting himself with stones. He was some distance away when he saw Jesus, so he ran, fell on his knees before him, and screamed in a loud voice, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, what do you want with me? For God's sake, I beg you, don't punish me. He said this because Jesus was saying, Evil spirit, come out of this man. So Jesus asked him, What is your name? The man answered, My name is Mob. There are so many of us. He kept begging Jesus not to send the evil spirits out of that region. Why would he not want him to send them out of the... Hmm. He there, thought, <laughs> maybe he thought this was his home territory. Oh. Uh, he's he's demon-possessed. This is the demons talking yeah. through him. Okay. There was a large herd of pigs nearby, feeding on the hillside. So the spirits begged Jesus, send us to the pigs and let us go into them. He let them go, and the evil spirits went out of the man and entered the pigs. The whole herd, about 2,000 pigs in all, rushed down the side of the cliff and into the lake and was drowned. Can you imagine what kind of financial disaster that would be? Well, we're going to find out who's, going to, who's the, the who, people who lost everything yeah. in just a moment. Go ahead. The men who had been taking care of the pigs ran away and spread the news to the town and among the farms. People went out to see what had happened, and when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who, had, who used, to be, used to have the mob of demons in him. He was sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were all afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the man with the demons and about the pigs. So they asked Jesus to leave the territory. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had had the demons begged him, let me go with you. But Jesus would not let him. Instead, he told him, go back home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how kind he has been to you. So the man left and went through the ten towns, telling what Jesus had done for him, and all who heard were amazed. Okay, so if a night before on the lake was unforgettable, I mean, you know, you, you just sort of recover from one miracle, and bam, there's another one. Yeah. The arrival at the Gadarenes the next morning was just as impressive. The history of the demon-possessed man is laid out in heartbreaking detail. And I just should mention in passing that Matthew says there were two of them. So probably there was one who was an outspoken leader and the other one wasn't so much so. But anyway, um, breaking away from all constraint, he lived in the tombs and cut himself with stones. No one had the strength to subdue him, Mark 5, 4. And then he met <clears throat> Jesus from was, our Bible study guide. Where does the story come in later on that they, when they came back, some time later, there was quite a group of we'll, we'll, followers. We're going to talk to about to that. that. Okay. <clears throat> it seems that this demon-possessed man, deep down inside, recognized that Jesus might be able to help him, even though he was possessed by a legion of evil spirits. So he cries, cries out, and so people are asking, the, the writers of this lesson say, he's shouting words from the devil, but... Deep inside, somewhere down there, there's a whisper, please help me. If you were a Jew living in the days of Jesus, would you have refused to use any of the water out of the Sea of Galilee after 2,000 pigs were drowned in it? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> or even the fish from the lake? Exactly. Okay. Jim, I think it's that one. Next one is yours, I believe. For the, from the writings of Ellen White. But the purpose of Christ was not thwarted. <laughs> He allowed the spirit, excuse me, evil spirits to destroy the herd of swine as a rebuke to those what Jews. What kind of people? Jews were doing what? 
raising, who were raising these unclean beasts for the sake of gain. Had they not had had not Christ restrained the demons, they would have plunged into the sea, not only the swine, but also their keepers and owners. Did the demons want to kill these people as well? The preservation of both the keepers and the owners was due alone to his power, mercifully exercised for their deliverance. Furthermore, this event was permitted to take place that the disciples might witness the cruel power of Satan upon both man and beast. The Savior desired his followers to have a knowledge of the foe whom they were to meet, that they might not be deceived and overcome by his devices. It was also his will that the people of that region should behold his power to break the bondage of Satan and release his captives. And though Jesus himself departed, the men so marvelously delivered remained to declare the mercy of their <coughs> benefactor. From the Great Controversy, page okay. 5. Okay, so Charles? <laughs> now, as Jesus starts his ministry among the Gentile territories, we see a similar scenario. Mark chapter 5, verse 2 tells us, When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. Now, we didn't, we haven't, filled in all the details here, but if you remember back in Mark 1, it starts out with Jesus going into the synagogue, and what happens in the synagogue? A demon-possessed man comes in and starts shouting, breaking <coughs> up the church service. So now, here's the same thing. He goes across to the other side of the lake, and what's there? A demon-possessed man shouting. Okay, go ahead. Both in the synagogue of the scribes and among the Gentiles, there were men with unclean spirits that needed to be healed. In both situations, there were men held captive by demons. Jesus came to restore these men to the kingdom. Okay, why don't we have obviously demon-possessed people in our day? We become smart and we hide it. We call it drug use. We call it insanity we call it dementia and there's Lots somebody by the name of satan who doesn't want us to believe that he the even deceiver. exists That's right. revelation 12 9 the deceiver of the whole world who's left out of the whole world yeah <laughs> and the whole world wondered after the beast yep and worshiped the beast again we see the interesting contrast between demon possessed individuals recognizing who jesus was while the jewish leaders were doing everything to deny that fact. From the Bible Study Guide, let us consider the information that Bark gives us about the man possessed by many demons. The man claims his name is Legion. A legion was a Roman military unit about the size of five to 6,000 foot soldiers. Wow. And a reference is given. No matter how overwhelming a human could have been no, no matter how overwhelmed a human could have been by such an evil force, there is no demonic entity that can resist or overpower, overcome the power of the Most High God from the Bible Study Guide. Do we have any questions now about whether or not Jesus is God? I mean, how much more evidence do you need? The fate of this demon-possessed man was cruel and bloody. Mark 5, verse 5, described his misery. And this is the man that came into the synagogue? Yeah. No, this is the one that at now the that... The, this is the, the one at the lake. At the, the lake, yeah. Caves. Mark 5, 5. Day and night he wandered among the tombs and through the hills, screaming and cutting himself with stones. The Bible study guide regarding the demonic, Larry Her Hurtado? Hurtado. Hurtado writes, the man who described is described as both fully captive of the powers of evil and beyond any human help, Mark 5, 2 to 4. Further, his dwelling among the tombs, the dwelling of the dead, almost makes him like a zombie, a living dead man. Finally, he is self-destructive, 5, 5, and obviously in torment. All of this is a powerful picture of how the New Testament describes the condition of humans apart from Christ spiritually dead and in bondage to evil. Wow. 
Do we have any people in our world like that today? Yes. This story has two, uh, from our Bible study guide again, this story has two overriding characteristics. First, it is filled with items of uncleanness or ceremonial defilement according to the Old Testament law. Tombs and the dead were unclean. Bleeding made one unclean. Pigs were unclean. This is all about a, unclean stories. While the people asked Jesus to leave the area, Jim, here's your comment, because of the loss of the pigs, the formerly demon-possessed man or man began to spread the news about Jesus so that the next time Jesus came to that area, everybody wanted to see and hear him. Okay, you want to read about that? Okay, Mark 10. Okay. Well, Mark chapter 8, verse 1 to 10. Not long afterwards, another crowd excuse me, another large crowd came together. When the people had nothing left to eat, Jesus called the disciples to him and said, I feel sorry for these people because they have been with me for three days and now have nothing to eat. If I send them home without feeding them, they will faint as they go because some of them have come a long way. His disciples asked him, where is where in the desert can anyone find food to feed all these people? How much bread have you got? Jesus asked. Seven loaves, they answered. He ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves, gave thanks to God, broke them, and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the crowd. And the disciples did so. They also had a few small fish. Jesus gave thanks for these and told the disciples to distribute them too. Everybody ate and had enough. There were about 4,000 people. Then the disciples took up seven baskets full of pieces left over. Jesus sent the people away and at once got into a boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. 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 There we go. Okay. There's a very interesting thing. A lot of biblical critics try to say Jesus only fed the, the crowds once. These two, this is just two tellings of the same story. No, because if you look at the story carefully, at the end of the five, feeding the 5,000, he gathered the pieces into what? Baskets. And what kind 12. of baskets? How many baskets? 12. 12 baskets. 12 baskets. And if you know the Greek, it's a specific kind of basket that was used by the Jewish people. And you come here, it's how many baskets? Seven. Seven and it's a specific kind of a basket that's used only by the Greek people. So just another little that's inter interesting thing. And it clearly has them in different areas yeah. also, and different numbers of people. Yeah. It is interesting to note that Matthew, in telling this story, suggests that there were two demon-possessed men instead of just one. These men were the first Gentile missionaries. Remember that Jonah was a missionary to the Gentiles of Nineveh. Uh, what, about 800 years earlier. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, he was immediately met by a crowd. And what was the crowd there for? What was all excitement about? Cool. Okay, uh, yeah, Mark 5, 21 to 24. Jesus went back across to the other side of the lake. There at the lakeside, a large crowd gathered around him. Jairus, Jairus, an official of the local synagogue arrived. And when he saw Jesus, he threw himself down at his feet and begged him earnestly, my little daughter is very ill. Please come and place your hands on her so that she will get well and live. Then Jesus started off with him. So many people were going along with Jesus that they were crowding him from every side. Okay, now let's just think about the, the background of this. Jairus was a religious leader of the local synagogue. What kind of a person was he supposed to be? <laughs> Big boss. He was supposed to be an opponent of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. But he also loved his daughter. He was willing to risk approaching Jesus as the only source of help. As we've already noted, the religious leaders were almost always very opposed to everything Jesus did. But here was a case where one of the Jewish leaders had a daughter who was very sick, and his love for his daughter overruled his natural opposition to Jesus. The Jewish leaders wanted to kill Jesus. Mark 3, 
I guess I can, we can look at this. Just look at Mark 3, verse 6. So the Pharisees left the synagogue and met at once with some men, uh, members of Herod's party, and they made plans to kill Jesus. Question. What if he was born in the home of the most prominent Jewish leader of that time? What if he was? He was born yeah. in the most prominent leader of Jewish leader of that time. And uh, he was Jesus. Everything he's doing now, he was doing, but he was son of the biggest boss. High priest. Or How would they treat him? Yeah. Natural Pretty. opposition. I wonder how they, how they... Mm. Well, it's... while Jesus was on his way from the shore to Jairus' house, there was an interruption. Mark 5, 25 to 34. There was a woman who had been suffering terribly from severe bleeding for 12 years. Even though she had been treated by many doctors, there weren't really good doctors back then, <laughs> apparently, not like you guys here. She had spent all her money, but instead of getting better, she got worse all the time. She had heard about Jesus, so she came in the crowd behind him, saying to herself, if I just touch his clothes, I will get well. Mm. She touched his cloak and her bleeding stopped at once. And she had the feeling inside herself that she was healed of her trouble. At once, Jesus knew that power had gone out of him. So he turned round in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? <laughs> his disciples, packing what in are from you all talking sides. about? Yeah. His disciples answered, you see how the people are crowding you. Why do you ask who touched you? But Jesus looked around to see who had done it. The woman realizing what had happened to her. So she came trembling with fear, knelt at his feet and told him the whole truth. Jesus said to her, my daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your trouble. Good News Bible. Imagine yourself like this woman who had been sick for so long and managed to touch the edge of Jesus' garment. She realized that he had been returned to perfect health. Notice these additional notes about the woman with the bleeding problem. From the Bible Study Guide, commentator Eugene Boring, M. Eugene Boring, adds another dimension to the misery concerning her malady. Since vaginal bleeding prohibited marriage and was the grounds for divorce, it is the understanding of her culture which she shared. The woman could not, cannot fulfill her function as a woman and bring new life into being as a mother. In addition, she had been impoverished because she had spent all of her money on physicians to no avail. The commentator adds, like the leper of Mark 1, 4, 40, her life is actually a living death. Her healing would be a restoration to life. Like the child who waits in Jairus' home, she is beyond all human hope. So if you go back and take time to read the passages in Leviticus. She wasn't allowed to, to go to the synagogue. She wasn't allowed to participate with any religious, She because he was perpetually unclean. Yeah. Oh. In this sandwich story, what do we mean by a sandwich story? A story in between. So the story starts out with Jair Jairus' daughter, and then this is interruption, and then there's, it comes back to Jairus' daughter. That's a sandwich story. Jesus hailed not only the 12-year-old girl who was dead, but also a woman who was originally and spiritually dead because of her bleeding. Other people apparently learned from this experience of the woman touching his garment. So we read in Mark 6, 56, and everywhere Jesus went, to villages, towns, or farms, people would take those who were ill to the marketplaces and beg him to let them at least touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were made well. So this is one story that we know about. How many thousands did the same thing? After the death of Jesus, even Peter's shadow, Acts 5.15, and the handkerchiefs of Paul, Acts 19.11-20, healed people. Or were these instruments of God that healed? Or were those instruments of God that healed the people? Of course, it's God's power that, we're in, that was involved. It's not really the handkerchief or the shadow or the... No, but the that garments. was the key instrument. Yeah. 
After people had come from Jairus' house to report that his daughter had already died, Jesus said, don't worry, just have faith. When they reached the place, the mourners were already making much noise. Jesus chased all of the mourners out of the house, took Peter, James, and John with the parents of the little girl, and went to her, into her room. Jim? Taking her hand, he said, Talitha kum. Mark translate these words, little girl, get up. Actually, the word Talitha means lamb, and thus would be, excuse me, would be a term of endearment for a child in the home. So you, you, told, you call your daughter little lamb, okay? Some do. The command to keep little things secret is, excuse me, to keep things secret is part of the revela revelation slash secrecy motif that runs through Mark and points toward Jesus, uh, towards who Jesus is and that ultimately he cannot remain hidden from the Bible. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you put all the Gospels together, people were flocking to him from down in the Sinai Peninsula all the way up to Damascus, at least that far that's named. And on the other side of the Jordan River, all the way to, to out to uh, Tyre and Sidon. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of miles. And Jesus thinks he can go into a house and hide? I mean, impossible. Well, well, Jesus told the people in the room not to say anything about what happened. It would have been impossible to keep quiet about that story. I mean, all those mourners out there, what do they know? This girl is dead, right? Um, considering all the people who were witnesses outside. Remember that she was the daughter of a prominent member of the city, one of the leaders of the Sanhedrin. Next, Mark's gospel reveals to, refers to events in Nazareth. Mark chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. Jesus left that place and went back to his hometown, followed by his disciples. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many people were there. And when they heard him, they were all amazed. I'm going to interrupt for a second. If you go back to Ellen White and you look, look at the story, she says that even when he was young, they, they called him to read the scriptures in the church because they, the, the, even the way he read the scripture would, would reveal new truths that people hadn't sort of realized before. So he was accustomed. This, this wasn't just a... Who is this and where did he come from? No, they, every time he was there, they wanted him to get up and read the scriptures. Well, every okay. time before, they had controversy with him anyway. Yeah. yeah. But even as a kid, as I said, yeah. He's, yeah. he did this. Okay, go ahead. Where did he get all this? They asked. What wisdom is this that he has been given, has been given him? How does he perform miracles? Isn't he the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Are all his sisters living here? And so they rejected him. I'm going to interrupt again for a second. You know, people say, he made, them, he made my couch, he made my bed, he made my, you know? Right, right. Well, go ahead. Jesus said to them, prophets are respected everywhere except in their own hometown and by their relatives and their families. He was not able to perform any miracles there except that the, he placed his hands on few sick people and healed them. He was greatly surprised because the people did not have faith. And from the Bible study guide, mm. you, usually when a small town person becomes popular, <clears throat> people back home bask in the attention not Nazareth. They were offended and surprised at Jesus' success as a teacher and healer. His shift from being a builder to a teacher seemed hard for them to accept. Now, do you think there might have been a special reason for that? You think Satan might have had something to do with that? I mean, I mean even if he's a carpenter and you know him as a carpenter, and now you see him teaching, and you know he's read in the, you know he's he's been he's known for reading in the in in the synagogue. Do you reject him and want to kill him? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Wasn't Gordon. it the 
same area or similar area where he read from Isaiah, it says, this day... Yeah, it's the same place. Same, same place, area. and same they wanted area. to kill him. Yeah. Push him off the cliff. There also may have been some animosity that he did most of his miracles in Capernaum, that is, instead of uh, Nazareth. Nazareth, yeah. yeah. And he had already had a disagreement with his family in Mark 3, 31 yeah. to 35. Mm. That's from the Bible study guide. There are some very important aspects of the story which Mark did not mention. And we've just talked about some of those. Luke 4, 16 to 30, some of the details are told. I think we have time to just look at that quickly. Then Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath, he went as usual to the synagogue. He stopped to read the scriptures and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. Now, I don't know if you, any of you have tried working with a scroll ever. He's taught, Jesus is working with a scroll. He's reading a language which theoretically he doesn't even know. This is Hebrew, not Aramaic. Aramaic is his home language. And he goes straight to the place and he reads, he finds the place and he preaches to the people from that spot. I mean... He probably had it memorized. Do you think he opened the scroll and said, it's in here. I'm going to, re I'm going to say it from memory. I suppose that, that's possible. Okay, go ahead. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recover of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed, set free the oppressed, and announce the time has come when the Lord will save his people. And what was, what was the wrong with that whole presentation? One big problem. He didn't go on. He didn't go on. What did the next sentence say? And set, set the captives free from the Romans. Well, and conquer our enemies. Conquer our enemies. And that was the place they wanted to, that was what they wanted to hear. And he didn't mention that part. <laughs> There's some very important aspects of the story. We've looked at that. In, in this passage, some of the details are told. Jesus was rejected by the people of Nazareth for at least three reasons. What were the reasons without looking? He was, he was the he, carpenter's son. Basically, he claimed to be the Messiah. And he mentioned two stories out of the Old Testament where Jesus, where God, through his prophets, favored Gentiles over Jews. Oh dear, how could you do such a thing? And it's, you know, superficially you look at that story and you think, Jesus is just trying to cause trouble. I mean, did, did he need to mention those stories? Well, the disciples were excited about the fact that they had been sent out to the different towns in Galilee and given powers to heal and raise people from the dead. They seemed to have had they seem to have a good reception. By contrast, there was a mention of the beheading of John the Baptist by Herod. So here we have, they're coming back to tell Jesus about the wonderful response they've had from preaching around Galilee, healing people, all kinds of stuff. And they get, they, then they receive news what? What's the news? John the Baptist. Okay, Myra. From the Bible Study Guide, the silencing of the, vo of the clarion voice of, Bap of the Baptist occurs at the same time as the Twelve Apostles proclaim repentance. Just as the Baptist did, John's death foreshadows Jesus. John is put to death, buried, and reported as risen from the dead, Mark 6, 14-16, and verse 29. Who was it that was saying that John the Baptist had come back to life? Herod. Herod, yeah. Him. He was scared to death, okay? <laughs> yeah, he should have been. Um, but? As Jesus would be in Mark 15 and 16. Yeah. These parallel stories point toward the coming crisis for Jesus and his followers. Hmm. When King Herod heard about the miracles Jesus was doing and the word of his, work of his disciples, he was certain that John the Baptist had been raised back to life. Yeah. Well, on another occasion near the Sea of Galilee, let's pick out another story in these, these couple of chapters here. 
Mark 6, 34 to 52, when Jesus got out of the boat, he saw this large crowd and, went, went, and his heart was filled with pity for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many, teach them many things. When it was getting late, his disciples came to him and said, it's already very late. This is a lonely place. Send the people away and let them get, go to the nearby towns and villages in order to buy themselves something to eat. Now this is after he's already fed 5,000. You yourselves give them something to eat, Jesus answered. They asked, did you, do you want us to go and spend 200 silver coins? That's a, that's a year's salary for a common working man on bread in order to feed them. Jesus asked them, how, many, how, many, how much bread have you got? Go and see. When they found out, he told them five loaves and also two fish. These, are, these loaves are like a small biscuit or something like this, maybe a little bit bigger than just a biscuit, but not much. Jesus then told his disciples to make all the people divide into groups and sit down on the green grass. So the people sat down in rows in groups of 100, groups of 50. Then Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish, looked up to heaven and gave thanks to God. He wrote the loaves and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. By the way, I rushed past here where it says the green grass. Some people say that's evidence that this was Peter's gospel. He's the one of the disciples that would have mentioned the green grass. <laughs> I don't know why they say that, but you know, that's one that's supposed to be one of the arguments for the, the fact that Peter, this is Peter's gospel. Okay. Everyone ate and had enough. <clears throat> then the disciples took up 12 baskets full of what was left of the bread and the fish. The number of men who were fed was 5,000. And I already mentioned to you that these baskets are Jewish baskets, not Gentile baskets. At once, Jesus bade his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida. And why is he commanding them to do that? Because they were ready to make him king. They were, boy, all the people were saying, hey, and later in, in the book on Judas, <clears throat> the chapter, I'm saying, the chapter of, on Judas in Desire of Ages, she suggests that Judas, that Judas was one of the people who was really trying to fomenting this idea. One of the disciples was really trying to foment this idea. So Jesus said, get in the boat, go. And she just says, there was no saying no. He told the people to go also. Then he told the people to go. Okay. Then he went to pray. After saying goodbye to the people, he went away to a hill to pray. So what was he doing up there praying? I have suggested, and you can, you can argue with me if you want to, but I'm, I'm absolutely certain that Jesus every night in his prayers was planning with his father what they would do the next day. So he had, he had plans. He, he knew what he needed to do. When, a, when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, Jesus, while Jesus was alone on land. He saw that his disciples were straining at the oars because they were rowing against the wind. So sometime uh, between three and six o'clock in the morning, he came to them. So at what point in the day is this? I mean, I'm sorry, what point of the night? This is what's called the third watch. I mean, you know, the night's almost over. Yeah. He's just stopped praying. Yeah. He was going to pass them by, but they... <laughs> you know, Jesus obviously is headed straight for them. He's going to pass them by? I, I, I think Peter was stretching the truth here a little bit. Um, he was going to pass them by, but they saw him walking on the water. It's a ghost, they thought, and screamed. These are fishermen. Mm -hmm. They were all terrified when they saw him. Jesus spoke to them once. Courage, he said, is I, don't be afraid. <laughs> then he got into the boat with them, and the wind died down. Didn't even have to tell it to. There's, this is part of the reason why I think that other time was a was a demon thing. I think this was too. When Jesus gets into the boat, the devil backs off, right? The disciples were completely amazed because they had not understood the real meaning of the feeding of the 5,000. Their minds could not grasp it. So how do you think you would have responded to all those miracles? What would you, what, what, let me just ask one simple question. What do you think 
happened with the leftovers from these two feedings. That can't be too difficult. Let them take them home. They were fed. People would take them home and what would happen? Share. Guess Can you guess where this bread came from? <laughs> Can you where this, guess where this fish came from? Mm -hmm. And then they would tell the whole story. I mean, there were thousands of missionaries scattered all over the Galilean area, telling, retelling Jesus' story. <coughs> so those but, baskets, what? But the disciples did not understand. Well, the people certainly didn't understand. And the disciples didn't. Only they, one did, Jesus. They, but they told the story. They enough so. it, yeah. And they would remember that story, absolutely. In their enthusiasm, after feeding the 5,000, this is from Ellen White, the people are ready at once to crown him king. They see that he makes no effort to attract attention or secure honor to himself. And this he is essentially different from the priests and rulers. Hmm? Different than the priests and rulers? <laughs> And they fear that he will never urge his claim to David's throne. Consulting together, they agree to take him by force and proclaim him the king of Israel. The disciples unite with the multitudes in declaring the throne of David the rightful inheritance of their master. It is the modesty of Christ, they say, that causes him to refuse such an honor. Let the people exalt their deliverer. Let the arrogant priests and the rulers be forced to honor him who comes clothed with the authority of God. It's our page, it's page 378, and if you have the, this little handout on your computer, you can double-click on that little, or hold down the control button and double-click on it, and it'll take you straight there so you can see the whole context. Following that miraculous feeding of the 5,000 men, Jesus commanded his disciples to get into the boat and leave the area. Then he politely, but forcefully, sent the crowd home. In the third watch of the night, between 3 and 6 a.m., Jesus walked across the water and approached the boat where the disciples were trying to reach shore. Matthew, excuse me, Matthew told about Peter's experience of asking Jesus to allow him to walk on the water and then losing his faith as he looked back at the other disciples and almost drowned. Why do you suppose Mark, which is Peter's gospel, didn't mention that part of the story? Peter may not have told it, didn't want to be embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> I think Peter would, yeah. By the time this gospel was written, Peter says, I don't want to do anything that makes me stand out as special in any way. Especially, I don't want to think, don't want people to realize that this fisherman is about to get himself drowned. The people around the Sea of Galilee, seeing miracle after miracle, even and even Jesus feeding the 5,000 men, were sure that he was the one who was to be the future king of Israel, and that he would help them to throw out the Romans and rule the world. If you had seen all those miracles, would you, would you have any question about Jesus' ability to do that? No. No, I mean, anybody, if you went out and went out, went out to fight the Romans, if anybody got wounded, you would heal him. If the army needs to be fed, you feed him. I mean, how could you win against somebody who was like that? How could you lose? Yeah, how could you lose, exactly. Uh, okay, where are we? The BS Guide. Mm -hmm. Yet Jesus does not meet their false expectations. Instead, he sends his disciples away and dismisses the crowd. And rather than lead a rebellion against Rome, what does he do? He treat, retreats to a mount, mount to pray not what the people were expecting or hoping. This is from the Bible study guide. Jesus said he had come not to help them overcome the Romans, but to help them get out of the bondage of sin. That was not what they were looking for. Charles? Um, <coughs> 33? 32. 32, okay. What should this story tell us about why a correct understanding of the prophecy is important. If a false understanding of Christ's first coming led to disaster for some, how much more could a false understanding do the same for some to regard his second? Yeah, is it possible that we could be 
misunderstanding and misinterpreting some aspects of the second coming. Do these stories certainly, tell us anything? Certainly not. Not oh, us. No, not us. Do these stories tell us anything about how we should be preparing? From the desire of ages. In all who are under the training of God is to be revealed a life that is not in harmony with the world, its customs or its practices. And everyone needs to have a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. We must individually hear him speaking to, to the heart. When every other voice is hushed and in quietness we wait before him. The silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. He bids us be still and know that I am God. Here alone can true rest be found. And this is the effectual preparation for all who labor for God. Amid the hurrying throng and the strain of life's intense activities, the soul that is thus refreshed will be surrounded with an atmosphere of light and peace. The, the life will breathe out fragrance and will reveal a divine power that will reach men's hearts. Desire of Ages 363. Can you imagine what would be, what would happen in this world that if every Seventh-day Adventist, not to mention every Christian, would do that? A day is coming, I believe. If you had been a Jew in those days, wouldn't you have been, have, have, I'm sorry, wouldn't you have wanted that? And Ellen White again? Myra? Okay, we only have a minute left. Yeah. Their oh. dis dissatisfied hearts queried why, if Jesus could perform so many wondrous works as they had witnessed, could he not give health, strength, and riches to all his people, free them from their oppressors, and exalt them to power and honor. The fact that he claimed to be sent of God and yet refused to be Israel's king was a mystery that they could not fathom. His refusal was misinterpreted. Many concluded that he dared not assert his claims because he himself doubted that the divine character of his mission the divine character of his mission. Thus, they opened their hearts to unbelief and the seed which Satan had sown bore fruit of its kind in misunderstanding and de defection. Okay. Desire of ages. So, we've already run out of time. We'll leave you to look at the rest. Our kind and wonderful Father, with this incredible array of miracles surrounding the Sea of Galilee. Try to imagine, help us to try to imagine what it, had been, what it would have been like to live there. I mean, every day you hear about another miracle that Jesus is doing somewhere around that lake. Would you be able to do anything else? You just want to be a part of it every day, as were his disciples. Help us not to make those kinds of mistakes that some made in those days, but even today, Help us to turn back to you, to live the kind of lives you ask for, to witness as you ask us to, so that we may soon see you come again, is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.